Here we go, recording. Okay, so um, everybody's got a quiz, right? Everybody got a quiz? So, um, yeah, how do we do on the quiz? I would say that it was very much kind of sink or swim. <laughs> um, a number of us did pretty well. You know, and I, I would say on these quizzes, a score of, you know, 15, 16, you know, 14 is probably even a pretty decent score, too, on these. Um, if you got much below that, then it's probably, you know, missing something. Right? And so, once again, the purpose of these quizzes is first to give you a lot of opportunity, right, to get feedback, right? I think partly it's to kind of force you to keep up with the material because this class is very much a class that builds upon what we talked about yesterday, right? So, what we do in day two builds on what we talk about day one, what we talk about today builds on what we talked about yesterday. And so, it's really important to get off to it, you know, to, to keep up with the material. So that's, that's part of it. If you didn't do as well as you wanted on the quiz, it's not the end of the world, but you need to keep, take this as a learning opportunity, right? You need to see this as an opportunity to figure out maybe what you're missing, or maybe you don't, didn't quite understand all the, you know, the fine details, right, of what we were talking about. And so this is a really good learning opportunity to make sure that you know, if you're missing something, you get it right because it's, you can do very well in this class by doing poorly on the quizzes and well on the exams. You cannot do well in this class by doing well on the quizzes and poorly on the exams, okay? So in other words, if you use this as a learning opportunity to do better on the, the exams, you'll be good, right? You'll be good. So let's talk through the quizzes um, and then you know, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll go at kind of a reasonable pace here, but please jump in. If there's a question, if you don't understand something, please jump in and ask me to explain some more. Okay, so question number two, true, false, explain. A change in supply always leads to a corresponding change in demand as price changes. This is false. And this seems picky, but it's not. It, if it was to be true, it would read, a change in supply always leads to a corresponding change in quantity demanded, right? Not in demand, but in quantity demanded. So let me share my screen here. Is this working? What's going on? Sorry, hold on. <clears throat> Something's working funny. <laughs> uh, nothing can be easy. Whoa, something really weird is happening here. Sorry, hold on folks, we're having some technical difficulties again. You've got to be kidding me. Okay, sorry everyone, hold on one moment. Okay, is everybody still there? <laughs> yeah, something really unusual is happening with my computer and I can't figure it out. Ah, okay, Phew. okay, that worked. Okay, uh, can you all see? Can you see the, my, my screen? Okay, good. So, what is this first question asking about? Here we have demand and supply, right? So what happens if there is a change in supply? Supply shifts, right? Because a change in supply is a shift in the supply curve. What then happens to demand? There's a change 
in quantity demanded as you move along the supply curve, or I'm sorry, move along the demand curve. So is this picky? Yes, but you need to distinguish between a something that shifts the curve and something that moves along the curve. I think that was one consistent problem that we had on a lot of these supply and demand questions, was some of us were really confused about what shifts curves and what is a movement along the curve. Okay, question two, uh, define ceteris paribus. This means all else equal. Right, all else equal. So you change one thing, everything else being equal. What's meant by a perfectly competitive market, right? A perfectly competitive market has three things that are true about it. Homogenous good, large number of buyers and sellers, right? Everybody's a price taker. Right? So you needed to have those three things to get full credit for this. What's true about market equilibrium in a model that is perfectly competitive? Um, I would accept supply equals demand, or a better way of saying it is quantity supply equals quantity demand. In other words, there is no surplus or, sh or shortage. Question number four. Genetically modified oranges are not only larger, but they have higher nutrient value. What will happen in the market for oranges? So in this question, it seems to me there's two things that have changed, right? So remember, we're talking about the market for orange juice. What are the two things that have changed? Oranges are larger. What does that mean? More juice, right? There should be an increase in supply. Also, they have higher nutrient value. Higher nutrient value, to me, should increase the demand for oranges because they're more useful. And so it seems to me that both supply and demand would go up. What happens to quantity? It goes up. What happens to price? We can't tell, right? Without knowing how big these shifts are, we can't tell. It could stay the same, it could go up, it could go down. So the best answer here is that price is indeterminate. Right? The best answer here is that price is indeterminate. On these supply and demand questions, I was actually open to alternative explanations, right? And this is definitely true on the second page. But you have to explain to me, right? You have to explain to me. You just can't shift something, and then if it's not what I'm thinking, I can't give you credit, right? Because you have to if you have to explain what you're thinking. And so some of you, you know, you kind of had half of this, but you, you know, a couple of you had like supply shifting to the left. I mean, maybe that was just an outright mistake. Maybe you had some rationale for it, but if you couldn't explain it, it's hard for me to give you credit for that. Okay, question number five. Suppose that the price of gasoline falls. What happens in the following markets? Um, the market for autos. Well, what's the relationship between automobiles and gasoline? Complements, right? So if the price of a complement falls, the demand for that good should go up. Notice that when demand goes up, there's not a shift in supply, there's a change in quantity supplied, right? So we move along the supply curve as the price rises but that does not shift supply. It's just a movement along the supply curve. How about the market for bicycles? What's the relationship between gas and bicycles? Anybody? What's the relationship between gas and bicycles? Yeah, I would say that they're substitutes, right? So this should be a decrease in the price of a substitute. So if this price of substitutes go down, what happens to the demand for bikes? I would argue that demand goes down, price goes down, quantity goes down, and we move along 
our supply curve. Somebody, I can't remember who it was, said, oh, but if gas is cheaper, then I want to go on more big bike trips. And to get to the places I want to ride my bike, I got to drive. And so cheaper gas means I'll ride my bike more. Yeah. I mean, I think I accepted that, but I think you're stretching, right? <laughs> you're stretching. And the more obvious effect here is I think that the bikes and gasoline are probably more substitutes than complements. But, you know, once again, if you can be persuasive to me, right, I'm, I'm kind of willing to buy it. Um, how about home delivery? Supply would increase. Supply would increase. That's, that's what I was thinking, Max. I, I thought supply would increase. And why did you think supply would increase? Because uh, lower gas prices would encourage uh, like uh, home delivery drivers to deliver more. Right, right. It, right. It's essentially a decrease in the price of an input, right? So if input prices go down, I would expect supply to go up. And quantity to go up. All right, that to me seems like the most reasonable answer. A few of you said, well, you've saved so much money on gas that you'd have more money to order in. Uh, I might have bought that, but you're stretching it once again, right? You're <laughs> I mean, usually for these, there's a fairly obvious connection to one of those things that we've talked about in class that shift demand and supply. And so you want to think about the obvious connections. But, you know, as I said, one, I wouldn't say it's a common problem, but some problem that, that a few of you had was still being uncertain about what things shift demand, what things shift supply, but also the fact that when supply shifts, you move along your demand curve, right? And when demand shifts, you move along your supply curve, right? So the difference between a change in demand and a change in quantity demanded is something that I still think a few of you have to work on, right? Finally, why do economists disagree? This is really right from our discussion in class. And in class, I talked about three reasons why economists disagree. We don't have any ex controlled experiments. There's a lot of def disagreement about what is fair. And third, the fallacy of composition. And so I wanted you to talk about at least one of those things, right? At least one of the, those things. Um, just saying that economists are, uh, you know, so, <laughs> I don't want to call somebody out, but I think somebody said something like, economists just don't know what they're talking about. Well, first off, that's not a good way to get points for me. I don't know if you guys know, but I'm an economist. So, <laughs> um, but anyway, um, so yeah, I wanted you to talk at least about at least one of those three in a little bit of detail, okay? So, um, any questions about the quiz overall, right? Any questions about the quiz overall? So tomorrow, we're going to take our second quiz, right? So we're going to be right back at it. Um, what's the quiz tomorrow going to be on? It's going to be on comparative advantage from chapter two, which is what we talked about yesterday. And it's going to be on GDP and inflation, which is what we began to talk about yesterday and what we're going to talk about today. Okay, so that's going to be what's on the, the quiz tomorrow. So from those two chapters, okay? All right. Okay, so you guys look like you might want a little good news here. Um, first off, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know why this video keeps on shutting off. There we go. Um, so here's my, my little gift for you. We're not going to have class this afternoon, right? We're going to take a little bit of a break, midweek break. So we'll have class this morning. We won't have class this afternoon. That will be a good opportunity for you to catch up and to, uh, yeah, get, get caught up on your reading, get, get caught up on the material. Um, for those of you who are in person, I will hang out a little bit after class. And so if you want to come and talk to me about your quiz or about anything else, feel free to do that. For those of you who are in person, um, if, you want to e if you want to talk to me, uh, you can send me an email. We can set up a Zoom. Um, I have a, a bit of a hectic afternoon, but I'd, I'd probably be able to fit you in somewhere. Okay, so anyway, this would be a good, good time for you to check in with me if you want to do that, all right? Okay, well, in the interest of time, let's jump into what we're going to talk about today.
which is uh, continuing, continuing this discussion here about GDP and inflation. So yesterday, we really kind of talked about GDP, right? And I won't, um, I won't go back and kind of uh, review what we talked about yesterday, other than just to very briefly say, it. we talked about what GDP is, right? Its definition, we talked about what it measures. Remember, it measures aggregate income, aggregate expenditure, aggregate output. We talked about the components of GDP, how you can break out GDP into different ways. And the, the way that we will use most often in this class is that equation y is equal to c plus i plus g plus x minus x. Okay, so in other words, you can break GDP down to whether it's a consumption good, investment good, government purchases, exports, or imports. And then the last thing, well, I guess two more things that we talked about yesterday with regard to GDP is we talked about the difference between real and nominal GDP, right? Who remembers what's the difference between real and nominal? What does nominal mean? Measured in current prices, meaning not adjusted for inflation. And what does real GDP mean? Measured in constant prices, right? And adjusted for inflation. And so obviously, when we talk about GDP, we need to think about inflation as well, because GDP incorporates current prices. By incorporating current prices, it also, in some sense, uh, incorporates inflation, at least nominal GDP does. And so let, let's talk about inflation and how we measure it. Okay, inflation. What is inflation, right? What do economists mean by inflation? One of the things I really want to emphasize in this class, and this will be something that might help you think about the quiz tomorrow or, or the exam next week, is I'll just be honest with you, I love asking definitions, right? I love asking definitions on these quizzes and exams. Why? Because understanding definitions is really a way of understanding what we're really talking about. And so economists use words like inflation in a very specific way, right? We mean something very specific when we talk about inflation. But oftentimes, in general usage, the word inflation gets tossed around to mean a whole bunch of things, right? So what do economists mean when they talk about inflation? Inflation is the percent change It's the percent change in the economy-wide price level. In the economy-wide price level. Okay? So, in many ways, When we talk about inflation, we are not talking about the price of one or two goods. We're really talking about the prices of everything, okay? So, you know, if you say, well, there's a freeze down in Texas right now, and as a result, the, um, you know, crops are being destroyed and the price of salsa is gonna go up. Well, that's not inflation, right? Because it's way too narrow, it's really, you know, Tomato crops are destroyed, so the price of tomatoes go up. That's not inflation. We're talking about the price of everything, the economy-wide price level, right? The economy-wide price level. So how exactly do we measure this? Well, really, we've already talked about a measure of inflation, right? We don't realize it. You probably don't realize it, but we've already talked about one measure of inflation. 
And this is what your, your book calls the aggregate price index. The aggregate price index includes everything in GDP, right? It's basically a measure of inflation that includes everything in GDP. So how do we get this measure of inflation? Well, there's really two steps. The first step is you calculate the aggregate price index. Right, so for every year, you calculate the aggregate price index. And what is this index? It's just the ratio of nominal to the real GDP. Why is this a measure of how prices have changed? What is nominal GDP? That's how we calculated nominal GDP. Current prices times quantity. And what's real GDP? constant prices times the same quantity. So this is just a ratio of current prices to constant prices, right? This is just a ratio of current prices to constant prices. And we multiply by 100, okay? So what this really is, is this is giving us an index of how much, current, how much higher current prices are relative to the base. Then how do we get inflation? Well, remember inflation is a percent change. So, we would calculate inflation as, actually, let me change the numbers here. We would calculate inflation as just simply the percent change in the aggregate price level. I ran out of room there. But the percent change in the aggregate price level would be what the aggregate price level is in 2020 minus what it is in 2019, divided by what it is in 2019, times 100. APL is just the aggregate price level. Okay, so inflation is just the percent change in this aggregate price level. So this is one way to measure inflation, right? One way to measure inflation is essentially look at our GDP data, right? And calculate what we call the aggregate price level. Let's do an example from yesterday. Remember, If we remember yesterday, we found that nominal GDP was 
All right, gotta go back and look at my notes. 1700, right? Yeah. And in 2020, we calculated nominal GDP to be 2300. And real GDP to be 1400. Okay, remember we use these numbers. So this is from the example that we worked yesterday. So now let's calculate what the inflation is based on the aggregate price index. So what's the first step? We calculate the aggregate price index for both years. What's the aggregate price index in 2019? 100, right? 100. In the base year, the aggregate price index is always going to equal 100. Okay, so because 2019 is the base year, nominal GDP is always going to equal real GDP, and so you're always going to get an index of 100. What about for 2020? We take nominal GDP, we divide it by real GDP, we multiply by 100, and what do we get? That's 164, those of you who read the calculator. So that's step one. What's step two? What do we do in the next step? We calculate inflation by taking the percent change in those numbers, right? Remember, we always use the recent observation minus the old observation divided by the old observation. Right, so this is 20. 19, 19. And what do we get? Inflation was 64%, right? 64%. Okay. I think this is high. Uh, we'll talk about inflation later. Countries have had much, much higher inflation rates, right? In fact, in 2009, I was in Zimbabwe when they had a 100% a day inflation rate. 100% a day. So as we, I'll sh show you a, a little picture here in a minute, but uh, the cost to ride the bus when I was there cost $50 billion. 50 billion Zimbabwe dollars, right? So yeah, right? Inflation can be very high in certain places, right? So 64% is not a crazy number if we look across countries throughout history. So that's, this is one measure of inflation, right? This is one measure of inflation. And we've already kind of done the dirty work and understanding this, right? What's the key about this measure of inflation? It includes everything in GDP. It's, you really, <laughs> it's really looking at inflation as everything in GDP. It is a very broad measure of inflation. Right? A very broad measure of inflation. Ah, sorry. So it's a very broad measure of inflation. It's so broad that in some sense, it's not 
Well, it's not useful for every sort of question that economists have, right? For instance, one of the problems with the GD, with this aggregate price index is that it includes things like what happens to the prices of aircraft carriers, right? And what's happening to the price of complicated machinery that firms use. But if you're just in a regular citizen and you want to know what the cost of living is, is this aggregate price index really measuring what your cost of living is? Not really, because there's so much in this that, that, that is not really associated with consumer goods. And so as a result, there's a second measure. Of inflation. In many ways, this is the one that's more broadly used, or at least more broadly reported in, in the newspaper. And this is called the Consumer Price Index. Okay. The Consumer Price Index. The Consumer Price Index, as you might guess from the its name is really focused on consumer goods. In other words, its focus is more on what we can think of as the cost of living. And this is, as I said, the measure of inflation that is most widely reported in newspapers, um, you know, when you hear um, people talking about what's happening to inflation, they usually refer to the cost of the, the CPI. And as we're going to talk about, this is essentially the measure of inflation that the government uses when they adjust things like Social Security payments, right? So every year, uh, Social Security payments get adjusted by the cost of living. How do they measure the cost of living? They use the consumer price index, right? So if the consumer price index says the cost of living went up by 2%, then Social Security payments go up by 2%, okay? How do we measure this, right? Well, in many ways, this looks a lot like the aggregate price index, but the focus of the goods is much narrower. And by narrowing the focus, this leads to a couple of other less obvious changes that we want to talk about. But on the surface, it looks a lot like what we've already done, all right? So the steps here. Okay, so the first step is you fix the basket of goods that a typical household buys. So in other words, what the government does, this is the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. They actually go out and they conduct surveys of finding how much a typical household buys. So just to get some idea of you know, what a typical household buys, Okay. So just to kind of give some feeling for what kind of goods are included in the consumer price index. Um, you know, about 43% of what's in the consumer price index is housing expenses, right? Basically how much you pay for rent, how much you pay for mortgage. And once again, the focus here is on the average household, right? The household with 2.2 kids and, you know, um, whatever is average nowadays. Um, about 15% of this basket is related to food and beverages. About 12% is transportation. Medical care is about 9%. Education, 7%. Recreation, 6 Motor fuel, 3%. Apparel, 3%. And then just other things, right? So that just gives you an idea of what the consumer price index is looking 
Okay? And so that's what they call the basket, right? The basket that this typical family buys every month. Okay, once you get the basket, then the next step is you got to find the prices of all the goods in this basket. So the government, every month, they have to go out and they have to collect price data on all of these goods and services. And that, in some sense, has become more complicated over time, right? Because it used to be that Americans kind of all shopped in the same way. Now, increasingly, Americans are shopping in much different ways, right? Many people have moved online. There's a lot more variety online than there is in person. And so, you know, this is a continual um, challenge for the government to be able to make sure that their prices reflect the prices that people are actually paying when they go shopping. Third, you calculate the consumer price index. And what is the consumer price index? It actually looks a lot like that aggregate price index. Does this look familiar? I, it looks a lot like the aggregate price index, right? The only difference here is instead of the, the, instead of measuring GDP in current prices, we just measure the cost of this basket in current prices. Instead of measuring GDP in base year prices, we measure the cost of the basket in base year prices, right? But very much like the aggregate price index, and so like. As a result, what's the next step then? You just take the percent change in this, and that's how you get inflation. So for instance, inflation between 19 and 20 would just be the percent change in the CPI between years 19 and 20. So you figure out what the CPI is in 20, subtract out the CPI in 19, divide by the CPI in 19, multiply by 100. So, on the surface, these look a lot alike. The aggregate price level looks a lot alike. The main difference on the surface is that just the goods that are included, right? The aggregate price level includes everything in GDP. The consumer price index focuses on consumer goods. Now, there's a deeper difference between these two that I'm going to come back and talk about in a minute, okay? But before I talk about the deeper difference between these two, let, let's just do a simple example. All right. Let me give you some numbers. Um, ordinarily, I would have maybe I have some of you come up and do this, but I think it's probably given um, given our circumstances. I'll just kind of work through this example up here and kind of talk as I work through it. Okay? And then you ask questions if something isn't clear. <clears throat> 
So let's say that we have, we have three goods, X, Y, and Z. I'm not feeling very creative this morning. And the government goes out and they estimate that in this basket, the typical household consumes 100 of X, 150 of Y, and 25 of Z. And let's say that the price in 2010 was this, and the price in 2011 These are the prices in 2011 and the price in 2012 is this. Okay, all this is given to us. And let's use Let's use 2010 as the base year, right? Let's use 2010 as the base year. Okay. All right, so in calculating the consumer price index, really these first two steps have been given to us, right? We're given what the basket is. The basket is 100, 150, 25. We're given what the prices are. So what's the next step? Calculate the CPI for each year, right? So what's the CPI in 2010? We don't even have to do any calculations for this. Because the 2010 is the base year, what's the CPI going to be? 100, right? It's always going to be 100 in the base year. Because current prices are the same as base year. So that one's easy. How about the consumer price index in 2011? All right, well, what's current prices times current quant times the basket? We have to do $1 times 100 plus 150 times 150 plus $3 times 25. Right? That's using current prices. Well, well, no. Do you see what I did? Yeah, I did the wrong. Did you use the wrong year? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I used the base year, right? In the numerator, it's the current year. So I need to use 2011 prices, right? 2011 prices times the quantity. At 2011 prices times quantity. And then in the denominator, I use the base year prices. Then I multiply that all by 100. Okay, so get out your calculators. I'll save you a little bit of, of busy work. And you should find that this is 132.8. Do all the, the grunt work here. How about 2012? Well, the denominator is all the same. Sorry, something 
right? The denominator is all the same. What's the numerator? Here we use 2012 prices times one, right? 2012 prices. So we use $1.75 times 100 plus two times 150 plus three times 25. Because in 2012, the price is three. Right? So if we do the busy work here, we should get that this is equal to 137.5. So what does this mean? That inflation, does this mean that inflation was 100% in 2010, and 132% in 2011, and 137% in 2012, right? No, no, right? How do we get the inflation rate? You gotta calculate the percent change, in this, right? You gotta calculate the percent change. So step four is calculate inflation between each of these years. We need to calculate inflation between 2010 and 2011, and then we need to calculate inflation between 2011 and 2012. So what is it between 2010 and 2011? This, because that's the CPI in 2010, that's the CPI in 2011. So inflation was 32.8% between 2010 and 2011. What about between 2011 and 2012? Well, in 2012, that's the CPI. In 2011, that's the CPI. And we get 3.5%. So inflation went down a lot between 2011 and 2012. All right, so that's the, the consumer price index, right? That's the consumer price index. Um, just as a side, let me say that this basic method can be used to calculate a price index of anything. In fact, there's you're probably familiar with some other price inde indices that are that are um, that use this method. You guys have heard of um, stock market indices, right? like the Dow Jones or the S&P 500, what are those? They're the consumer price index. The only difference is instead of looking at consumer goods, what's in the basket? The price of stocks, right? So the Dow Jones Industrial has the 30 largest co companies in the US in it. The S&P 500 has the 500 largest companies in the US in it. Right? But it's just a basket of goods, and then you just see how the price of that basket changes over time. So, you know, stock indices basically use the same idea, right? Just the goods that are included. There's also other indices out there that um, people who are in business or are just interested in the world follow. There's something called the producer's price index, and you can probably guess what that is. It's very much like the consumer price index, except it focuses on the price of things that firms buy, right? So it looks at raw materials and energy and those kinds of things, right? 
Um, and so there's, there's any number. There's, there's different raw material indexes. There's housing indexes that look at what's happening to the price of housing. But they're all built along the same idea, right? That you get a basket of goods, and then you see, you calculate a ratio of how that basket of things, how much it costs in current prices relative to base year prices, and then you see how that index changes over time. Right? It's, the, it's the same idea over and over. Let's, um, let's talk here about the differences. The differences between the consumer price index and the aggregate price index. Okay. The first difference, I think this is the one that's probably the most obvious to us. Is that the aggregate price index uses all goods in the GDP, while the consumer price index focuses on consumer goods? Okay, so that's the first one. Right? And I think that, that one is fairly obvious. But there's a couple of other differences that are not probably not as obvious that are worth talking about. One is Consumer price index actually includes imports, but not exports. The aggregate price index includes exports, but not imports. Right? Because exports are included in GDP, imports are sub subtracted out and not included in GDP. And so this is actually a, an, an important one because if you actually look at like many of the things that meant that most of the most Americans buy, a lot of them are imports, right? I mean, I, I think it's true. Maybe it's not true anymore, but it used to be true that there were no American, their tennis shoes were not made in the United States. We got to the point that there were no American made tennis shoes. So that's something that would not be included in the aggregate price index because they're not made here. But they are included in the consumer price index because we import them, right? Same thing for cell phones, right? Most cell phones are not made in the US. That's something that's excluded from the APIs, but it's included in the CPI. Okay. Then there's a third difference, and this is the one that I want to talk a little bit more about because it's, it seems like a very subtle difference, but actually it has some important implications. Quantities in the aggregate price index change all the time. As GDP changes. Quantities in the consumer price index are fixed. They are largely constant from year to year. So in other words, 
you know, as production goes up and down, quantities in the GDP go up and down. But in the consumer price index, what does the government assume? That households pretty much buy the same thing month to month and year to year. Yes, they update it, but they update it only periodically and they update it only gradually. Now you might say, okay, fine. But the problem with this is, is that this introduces some biases. is that it tends to overstate actual inflation. It tends to overstate actual inflation because of the way that the basket doesn't move from year to year. And why is that? Well, there's actually quite a few things. One is that there's a substitution bias. Sorry, I don't know where that's coming from. There's a substitution bias in the consumer price index. Okay. So let me explain it this way. Uh, there's a freeze down in Texas. As a result, the price of salsa goes way up. What are most households going to do? probably buy less salsa, right? They're gonna buy less salsa and more pepper. They get back to substitute. Probably it's not for me, maybe it is for some. <laughs> more ranch dressing, all right? So, <laughs> so people will switch to a cheaper substitute, right? But what's the consumer price index gonna say? You keep on buying just as much salsa, right? And so salsa is gonna weigh heavily in the measure of inflation. And the increase in the price of one good is going to push up overall inflation, even though it shouldn't, because when it's just one good that's going up in price, people just substitute away from it. And that's a problem. Right? Once again, the CPI is tending to overstate inflation. Right? It tends to overstate inflation. Here's another one. Sometimes there are unmeasured changes in quality that create a bias in the consumer price index. Okay, so for instance, I don't know if any of you bought a computer recently, but I've definitely noticed this with Apple. Maybe you have masks there, but I'm, I'm sure this is pretty well whatever. What happens when they come out with a new version of the master? What's the price of the new version? Pretty much that. Pretty much the price of the new version. But what do you get? You get upgrades, right? In other words, what, what really happened to the price of that new version? It's gone down. But that new computer in many ways is cheaper than the old version more for your money. But how does that get included in consumer price index? It's just the price, right? It's just the price. So you know, this is a problem. This is a problem is that goods don't stay the same over time. Um, there's unmeasured changes in quality, even for things like produce. <laughs> there's unmeasured changes in quality. As we get better, uh, you know, we get different varieties of apples and other kind of fruit, right? 
And so even if the price, sometimes the price goes up because of these excuse quality, but we tend to talk on these inflation and really that's not inflation. That's just a better bill. Like right? that's just a better bill. Um Another problem that the government constantly struggles with is um, new goods which are cheaper. The government catches up over time, right? They catch up over time with what's going on, but it's slow to adjust. So for instance, I guarantee you in calculating the consumer price index, that what is the consumer price index, assuming that people are still going to see movies, right? When, what do we know? People are not going to see movies, right? They're staying at home and watching Netflix. In, in large part because of COVID, but this was happening even before COVID, right? Staying at home is cheaper than going out. And so a lot of new goods, they're new because they're cheaper. But the consumer price index only includes them with a kind of a lag. And so we tend to miss these new goods that are cheaper. And so if you add all this up, is that the CPI tends to overstate inflation anywhere between a tenth of a percent and a percent a year. And why can't we give a more narrow range? Because they're really different in this year depending upon what's going on. It's just it's different. One reason it matters is that this is biased as our statistics. We don't want our statistics to be biased high or low. And so the fact that we can't bias or we can't measure inflation accurately means that when we calculate real variables, we're going to get distorted values. Right, because what is real again? It's adjusted for inflation. So if we adjust for inflation, but inflation is biased, then our results will be biased. And so for from economics, from an economist's point of view, this is important because we want to have accurate statistics, but it's very hard for us to get accurate statistics. Right? Um, all statistics have problems, and this is one of the problems with the consumer price index, is that while it's a widely reported measure of inflation, it almost certainly is a little high. Right? Almost certainly it's a little high, and sometimes it can be a lot high. This also matters because of policy. It also matters because of what are called cold. is a cost of living adjustment. That's just an abbreviation for a cost of living adjustment. So many contracts have cost of living adjustments in them, right? Um, you know, sometimes with uh, suppliers, right? You'll get into a contract with a supplier and they'll say, well, we're going, to, we're going to give you the input and the price of that input is going to go up at X percent every year, right? Or more commonly, this is very common in wage contracts, 
Okay. I don't know if any of your parents are in unions, but almost all union contracts have cost of living adjustments. Right? So you might find a five-year contract, and what does that, what does the COLA say? It says that your wage will go up by X percent, or more likely, it will go up by the consumer price index. And so often these COLAs are tied to the consumer price index. What does this mean? If the consumer price index is biased, what's true about the, the cost of living adjustment you get? It's biased too, right? It's too high. Um, this is a big problem with Social Security. Because Social Security has a COLA in it. It has a cost of living adjustment. I think I mentioned this just a little bit ago. That every year, uh, Social Security checks go up by the cost of living. And what is that cost of living measured? So how's that cost of living measured by the consumer price index? So who benefits from that? Government does? <laughs> well, the consumer price index is higher than true inflation. So what does that mean about your grandma's check she gets from the government? It's gonna go up by more than true inflation. So she benefits from that, right? This tends, this, this distortion tends to benefit those who are receiving payments. This tends to benefit the citizens. Who pays the costs? Who's paying the cost to your grandma's social security tax? Taxpayers. This distortion probably increases our deficit because it increases spending by about $30 billion a year. That's not a small amount of money. So yeah, you know, this is just a practical way that the statistics that we use in economics matter, right? They have real consequences, right? They have real consequences. Why don't we just get rid of this? Why, why doesn't the government pass a law that says, well, let's use the aggregate price index instead of the consumer price index? Who's gonna be pissed about that? Right, right? those who are retired. Who would be happy about it? Experts, particularly young people like you who have a lot of years of past to paying ahead of you. Um, why doesn't it get changed? <laughs> this is back to that special interest consideration, right? That a lot of you are share the cost of this, but it's kind of dispersed among a lot of people. Who gets the benefits concentrated in a small number of people? What's true about those small number of people? They vote. What's true about, don't mean you literally, but people your age? They largely don't vote, right? Or don't vote in nearly as high a percentage. And so it's the classic special interest, right? Um, that there has been talk about this in, in, in past budget negotiations, but it's inevitably fallen through because people realize that, you know, going against 
the retired the a AARP going against the retired people lobby is not good politics, right? It just simply is not good politics. So you know, here's another example where politics kind of throws a wrench in good economics, right? <laughs> I mean, this is this is a you know a distortion that was not intended. It's there, and yet we can't fix it because politics prevents us from doing so, right? And so if you if you actually look at the data, the good news is as inflation has been lower here in the US, and we're gonna talk about inflation much more. Or we're gonna talk about inflation much more in this class as we go along. But the good news is that as inflation has gotten kind of lower, that there are smaller differences between the consumer price index and the aggregate price index. Right? Um, but here, the purple line is this little part of the The purple line is the aggregate price index. So um, here it's called the GDP display. So we call, I mean, your book calls it the aggregate price index. So that's the purple line. And then the green line is the consumer price index. And the orange line is the producer price index. So what do we typically see? Um, the producer price index is a lot more fluctuation, a lot more up and down. And that's because there's a lot of things like energy prices and raw materials, the prices of which fluctuate a lot. If you just compare the consumer price index to the aggregate price index, once again, you see the consumer price index tends to fluctuate more. Than the aggregate price index, right? In part because a lot, you know, the consumer price index, a couple of the components in there are, are, are very sensitive to price fluctuations, such as food. Like food actually has a, a relatively big swing in price um, because of things like freezes, right? And so, um, you know, there's, there's, there's a, a more volatility in the consumer price index than the, the aggregate price index. But you'll notice here, because if you look, if you look back over time, there were bigger differences between the two. Those differences have really kind of shrunk over time, in part because the level of inflation has gone down. Right? Notice here, in 1980, we had nearly 20% inflation. Right? Regardless of how you measured it, we had about 20% inflation. The last few years, we've been very close to about 1% inflation, and in fact. Right, there's been in 2008, we actually had negative inflation for a brief period of time, right? Just like we had negative inflation back in 1929 during the Great Depression. So, you know, the good news is there's not today, as, as the level of inflation has gone down, there's not as big a difference between the consumer price index and the, the aggregate price index. So, um, so anyway, so, the, so the, there, there's how we measure it. Now, some questions that this graph should obviously raise in you is, well, why is inflation so much lower today than it used to be? And what the hell was going on in 1980? What, what the heck was going on in the 40s? What was going on in 1929? And we'll come back and talk about that, right? We'll talk about why inflation has gone up and down and what causes inflation a little bit more. But at least we now hopefully understand how we measure it. Okay, so that's the end of chapter seven, right? And that's really the end of the material that will be on your quiz tomorrow. So once again, your quiz tomorrow is going to be on uh, uh, comparative advantage for chapter two, and then everything in chapter seven related to GDP and measuring inflation, right? Okay, in the we still have about forty minutes or so. So I think what I'm going to do is let's move on to chapter eight. Get it? Get us start here on chapter eight. <clears throat> All right. I want you to stand up. Do a jumping jack. Yeah, sure. <laughs> 
Okay, chapter eight. We're going to talk about unemployment and inflation in this chapter, and specifically talk about unemployment. So some of the questions that we're going to address in this chapter here. Um, how do we measure unemployment? How exactly do we measure? Who gets counted as unemployed? Who doesn't? Why does unemployment matter? What's the relationship between unemployment and inflation? Because there actually is a relationship between unemployment and inflation. And we'll talk about that. And then towards the end of this chapter, we're going to come back and talk about why does inflation matter? Why, why should we be worried about inflation if it hits 20% or 0%? What's the difference? Right? What's the difference? Okay, so these are, these are a few of the questions that we're going to try to address in the chapter. So let's begin with the first one. How do we measure unemployment? All right. right, how do we measure unemployment? So you won't be surprised to find out that once again, here we have a statistic that is widely reported, closely followed, but suffers for some real limitations. Some real limitations in terms of how we interpret it. So how, how does the government go about measuring unemployment? Well, this is really done by the Bureau of Labor, Labor Statistics, right? Part, part of the Department of Labor. So they've got a team of economists. And what they do here is every month, they survey 60,000 households. And in every household, they figure out everybody that's 16 and older. And then they classify you as one of three things. You are employed. Meaning you're working more than 20 hours a week. You are unemployed, which means you're actively looking for a job. And then you are finally not in the labor force. which means that you are, you don't have a job and you're not looking. So oftentimes we think about the employed and the 
unemployed. The two of them together are the labor force. If you're either employed or unemployed, you're in the labor force. And if you're not in labor force, you're not looking. Why do we need this third category? Why, just, why don't we just call these people unemployed? Right. I mean, what's the what's the problem with? I mean, you're not looking for a job, right? So, which category do most of us fall into? Not in the labor force, right? Why why don't we want want the government to classify all of us as unemployed? Right. Right, I mean, we're really looking for people, we're, we're trying to distinguish between people who actively want a job and then people who do not want a job right now, right? So we don't want to include um, students or retired people in the labor force because they're not really in the labor force, right? They're not actively looking for a job. So that's why we have this third category. You're employed, you're unemployed, and you're not in the labor force. So basically these surveys, there's a series of questions that try to get at you know, get at which of these you really are, right? Which of these you really are asking, you know, how actively you look for jobs if you don't have a job, um, how much you work every week, these kind of things. Once we have this then, then the government can really calculate two statistics that are, are I think are even useful for us to think about. First is the unemployment rate, right? The unemployment rate. And the unemployment rate is just the number of people unemployed divided by the number of people in the labor force. Remember, the labor force is the unemployed plus the employed times 100. So what's the key thing to note here? The unemployment rate is not a percent of the population. It's not a percent of the population. It's a percent of the labor force. Once again, because we don't want to include people who are not in the labor force, right? They're explicitly excluded from this calculation. Now, what about those people who aren't in the labor force? Well, we really the way to think about how big they are is to calculate what's called the labor force participation rate. The labor force participation rate is the labor force divided by the population that's 16 and over. So this lets us know of everybody who's 16 and over, how many people are actually in the labor force and how many people are outside of the labor force. Okay. So that's how we calculate these two widely reported statistics, right? The labor force participation rate and the unemployment rate. Let's, um, let's just look at some data here. Can we all see this? This, uh, it should say at the top, labor markets and productivity. Can you see this online? Okay. So first let's look at this. Okay, I, granted this is kind of small writing, so it's a little hard to see. But um, the red line is the unemployment rate in the US. So let's look at the red line first. Notice this doesn't go down to zero. That's two and a half percent and five percent. Okay. 
And so what's happened to the unemployment rate here over the last, you know, since about the year 2000? We'll look at some longer data. In fact, I can show you some longer data here in a minute. But, you know, in general, you know, at least before the 2008 financial crisis, and over the longer run, unemployment tends to fluctuate around 5%, roughly, right? So we're going to have a name for that, but there's kind of a long run rate of unemployment. That is roughly about 5%. We'll talk about where that comes from. But what tends to happen during recessions, we tend to see a big jump up in unemployment. And specifically, that's these gray shaded areas. So in 2001, we had a recession where unemployment jumped up sharply. And then what happens after a recession? It falls back, but it tends to fall back very, very slowly, right? In other words, when people lose their job, they often do get back in the labor market, but it often takes them a long time, right? It often takes them a long time. So, you know, in 2001, which is a relatively mild recession, you see that unemployment went up, kind of actually was stable for a while, and then it only very slowly fell back down. Then in 2008, we had this big increase in unemployment from about 5% to almost 10%. And then what's happened since 2008? Well, there's basically been a decade of unemployment gradually falling back down, right? And you know, once again, this is very gradual and it took a long period of time. Um, before the COVID crisis, unemployment had actually reached 50-year um, lows, right? So we had, you know, kind of record or relatively recently record lows in unemployment. Then you can see what happened during COVID, right? That unemployment rate went from, you know, a little bit like 2.8% all the way up to almost 15%. Now, what's unusual about COVID was we don't usually see this with unemployment. Unemployment spiked way up and then it came right back down. A lot of it came back, right? So this was really people who really had those layoffs for the first couple of months when everything shut down, right? And when people were, I was gonna say when people were scared, I, feel, I still think people are scared. Maybe I should say when people were more willing to abide by social distancing requirements. <laughs> and so, you know, uh, you know so, so right when it happened, I think there were a lot of shutdowns, a lot of people just stopped spending and then, you know, after the, a few months, life has relatively turned, returned back to normal. I mean, not, not all the way back, but, you know, a lot of people have gone back to, to something that looks somewhat akin to the rel their, their uh, regular lives, or at least their spending patterns have. And so we've seen a lot of that unemployment go down. But, you know, I think most economists believe that how long is it going to take us to get down to here? Now the pace is going to be much slower, right? Because these are jobs, many of them, that just simply may not come back, right? Because, you know, for instance, we know that a lot of small businesses have closed. We know a lot of restaurants are closed. It's quite possible people are not going to go back to the same kind of behaviors they had before COVID in terms of travel or in terms of eating out. They might want to eat in more. Um, if you eat in, that means less of a need for people who, you know, are waiters or waitresses. So, you know, we'll have to see. But... But anyway, that, that's what the unemployment rate uh, looks like, right? That's what it looks like. What about the labor force participation rate? Um, this is really instructive, right? And this actually tells us a lot about what's been going on in the US economy if you look at this labor force participation rate. If I could, I'm trying to think. Well, I don't think I can do it on this version, but if we went back to the labor force participation rate all the way back to 1950, what would we see? That between 1950 and 2000, there was a big increase in the labor force participation rate. And what was driving that? What was driving that? women entering the labor force, right? That was almost entirely driven by women entering the labor force. But what happened in about the year 2000? 
In 2000, that process largely leveled off. And in fact, since 2000, we've had a gradual decline in the labor force participation. This is driven by a number of factors. Some of them are demographics. We have an older population. And so an older population, there's more retired people. But then there's some other things that are going on that we'll talk about. It, this is not just simply an older population, but we've had this kind of remarkable, I mean, not remarkable, but, but a disturbing decline in labor force participation, meaning less people are working or looking for a job. What happened to the labor force participation rate here in 2020? It crashed. This tells us a big problem with our unemployment rate. Because what happened to these people who left the labor force? Do we really think that all of them don't want jobs? No, there's good reason to think that many of them want jobs, but they're not looking. And why aren't they looking? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons. One is in, in the case of COVID, this might be people who have health concerns, right? That simply don't feel like they can get a job that exposes them to COVID. But the bigger problem here is that once you lose your job, and particularly once you run out of unemployment benefits, there's not a lot of incentive to keep on looking. A lot of people just simply get discouraged. And when they get discouraged and they stop looking, they get dropped out of the labor force, even though they might still consider themselves to be unemployed. Okay, so in other words, there are some, some big limitations. Hold on before I do this. Yeah, okay. So I think the question in the chat was, what is population 16 plus? Yes, it means everybody that's 16 and over, right? That's, that's the only people that the, the government surveys for these. So, so in other words, we have some problems with our unemployment statistics. One is what we call the discouraged worker effect. Right, so the long-term unemployed give up looking for jobs. As a result, they get dropped out of the labor force and they get dropped out of our unemployment rate. This is particularly true for people who are unemployed for longer than six months. Because typically, unemployment benefits in the US um, operate on, on essentially what's a 50-50 system. If you become unemployed, you get 50% of your previous pay at, for half a year, right? Half of previous pay for half a year. So what typically happens? To get unemployment benefits, you have to show that you're looking for work. So while you're eligible for unemployment benefits, people will look for work, right? But what happens if you're not able to find a job in those first six months? You tend to get discouraged. And once you get discouraged, when you get called by the US government and say, hey, have you been looking for a job in the last four weeks? And you say no, then your county is not in the labor force. Even though you might consider yourself to be unemployed, the government's not gonna consider you to be unemployed if you're not looking and so obviously what this means is that 
the way we measure unemployment tends to understate. Our un unemployment rate measure tends to understate true unemployment. Tends to understate true unemployment. That's what the discouraged worker effect is. And this is really important because it means we're missing a lot of people. Right, we're missing a lot of people. You really have to think about the unemployment rate as kind of a minimum, right? But in reality, it's, it's a floor. But, but in reality, true unemployment is almost certainly higher than that reported estimate, right? There's a couple of other problems with the way that we, we measure unemployment. It ignores um, the underemployed. or um, part-time, I should say involuntary part-time. So what happens if you are working 20 hours a week, but you're working 20 hours a week because the only job you can find is 10 hours as an Uber driver, five hours as an Uber Eats driver, and you know eight hours uh, working at an Amazon factory. Right? <laughs> um, well, you're getting 20 hours, the government's gonna consider you to be employed, but you probably consider yourself to be unemployed because you're having to manage three jobs that give you very little hours, right? Or this happens, you graduate from college. I, I, I definitely I'll tell you a story that doesn't make me sound like a very good person. Maybe it's an accurate story. But um, I lived with a guy for three years when he was in college, my roommate. And um, when we graduated, I went to graduate school and he couldn't get a job. And so he went home and worked at his local grocery store. And I would go visit him and go to his grocery store. He had to wear an apron. And I would just like laugh at him and make fun of him. And yeah, it's, it's not a very flattering picture of me. But did he consider himself to be employed? No, he considered himself to be unemployed, right? <laughs> he had a job, but obviously he was a college graduate, right? Um, one of the reasons I tell you this story is because that guy now makes... I won't even tell you how much he makes, but he could buy and sell me many times over, right? So he, he definitely got the, the last laugh. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, I mean, a lot of people technically are counted as employed, but, you know, it, it, is, it their, is it the job that they really want to do, right? And is it, is it sufficient to give them full-time employment? Oftentimes not, right? Oftentimes not. Finally, just one other problem. As we've already talked about here, unemployment really ignores the duration of unemployment. Oftentimes it's not that you're unemployed, it's for how long are you unemployed. Right? So a lot of people become unemployed, but most people when they become unemployed actually are unemployed for very short periods of time. Right? Because most people, why are they unemployed? Well, they want to move to a different part of the country, or their partner got a job and has to move, or they hate their boss, or they think there's something else out there that's better for them. Right? Those are actually the most common forms of unemployment. In fact, I'll show you a little um, data here. Right? And what we see is if you add these three together, about 
of unemployment is for less than 14 weeks. So, you know, three months or less. And, you know, half of unemployment is less than a month. So most spells of unemployment are relatively short. Okay? Um, I'm going to refer to this as churning. There's a lot of job churning that happens in the U.S. labor market. And that's a good thing. By churning, I mean people are just mixing up. Right? <laughs> They're moving around from different jobs. Um, what did I read? That, that for your generation, right? People that are your age can expect to have between six and eight jobs over your careers. Okay? Six to eight jobs. So, yeah, you know, if everybody has six to eight jobs, <laughs> that means that all of us in this room, or most of us in this room, are probably going to have brief periods of unemployment. And that's probably, that's actually a good thing in many ways, right? Because it means that if you hate your job, you can go get another one, right? Or you can go look for a job that better matches your skills. So a lot of unemployment is actually good in the sense that it's really helping people match up with better positions. And it's short. But, you know, this group right here, the group that has been unemployed for, you know, going on six months or more, that's the, that's the bad kind of unemployment. That's the kind of unemployment that we worry about. Because once you're out of the labor market that long, it's really hard to get back. And why is that? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons. One is, I just think there's a prejudice, right? Employers have a prejudice against people who have not been in the labor force for a long time. They figure, oh, what's wrong with them? Why haven't they found a job? But then there's also the very real problem of losing skills, right? The longer that you've been out of the labor force, the more that you lose skills. So uh, I just, my sister, uh, was out of the labor force. She's a social worker in a hospital, but she's out of the labor force for five years. And not because she was unemployed, but she just had some family things going on and she needed to be at home. Now she's gotten back in it. And it's just interesting to hear her talk about how much different the job is in five years. In terms of, you know, one of the things she says is like, the office is so quiet now, right? Everybody just texts instead of talking on the phone, right? <laughs> and all these little things, that are much different. And so, you know, you, the longer you're out of the market, the more skills you lose, the, the less easier it is for you to find a match to get back in. And so, you know, th that's, that's really important to, to recognize, right? Um, you can see what happened in 2008. It, during the global financial crisis, it wasn't just the fact that unemployment went up that was bad. It was, look what happened to the number of long-term unemployment that went way up, and that's what's really worrisome, right? That's what's really worrisome. So the fact that people lose their jobs and get another job in a couple of weeks, that's a good thing. The fact that people lose jobs and they can't get another job, or it takes them a very long time to get another job, that almost certainly is a bad thing. So as a result of these, I'll just show you this graph. As a result, our unemployment rate tends to underestimate true unemployment, right? You have to really think about this as a very low estimate. Here's uh, one, one economic study that's looking at the unemployment rate, which is this orange line, and then add to it discouraged workers, and then add to it marginally attached workers. Marginally attached workers are uh, workers who don't have permanent employment, but are more hired kind of on a month-to-month -month basis. And then add that to that, the involuntary part-time workers, and you can see that unemployment goes up and up and up and up, right? So the way we measure unemployment is really, right, the, the most conservative measure. And, you know, it's probably too conservative in many ways. So, you, so when, you, when you hear that the unemployment rate is 7%, you really have to think, uh, true unemployment is, is almost certainly greater than that, right? Almost certainly greater than that. Okay. So let's talk just really briefly here, because we only have just a couple more minutes. 
I want to talk about, in general, three sources of unemployment. Three reasons why we have unemployment. Um, you know, obviously, every individual case is, is different. But in general, you can kind of you know, roughly lump the reasons for unemployment into kind of three big categories. The first is what economists call structural unemployment. Structural unemployment comes from technological change in the economy. It's evolutionary, right? It's evolutionary. Okay, in 1800, what percent of Americans were farmers? What time? 1800. So 70%. I hear a 50%. I hear a 70%. 90%. 90% of Americans were farmers in 1800. In 1900, what percent of, of Americans were farmers? 50. Still, half of Americans were farmers. Today, what percent of Americans are farmers? 3%. 3% of Americans are farmers, right? So, uh, by the way, what's, what's happened to the amount of food that we've produced? It's gone up by fivefold, right? Part of the reason we need less people being farmers is that every individual farmer can produce so much more food, right? This is technological change. Has it put farmers out of work? No. Well, it. <laughs> It, it's, it's eliminated farming jobs, but it hasn't put those farmers out of work. What it has necessitated is that people have had to move to do other things, right? That's the nature of economic development, is that people have had to learn how to do other things. The problem is that in the short term, that can be a very costly process for individuals, right? So, you know, if you lose your job as a farmer, you just can't go out and start making computers, right? Um, and so oftentimes what we see is that industries die, then that does lead to some unemployment. And sometimes this unemployment for individuals can be long lasting. Um, you think about in the Midwest, you know, during the 1900s, the Midwest hit really two big technological changes. One of them we just talked about was farming. That's the one that a lot of people tend to forget about. A lot of people understand the other one, which is the, the decline in manufacturing. Right? But both of those things have happened at the same time. Both of those have hit the Midwest particularly hard because the Midwest really had kind of this dual economy, right? That we had a farming economy and we had a heavy manufacturing base. But what's happened to our economy over the last hundred years because of, largely because of technological change is that a lot of those jobs have disappeared. And now, what are the jobs that are growing? Well, information technology and jobs that require much higher levels of human capital, jobs that require much more creative thinking, right? Jobs that require much more quantitative skills, jobs that require much more social skills. So, you know, this is a nature, a change in the nature of our economy. Not everybody who could be a farmer can be an IT salesman. <laughs> Um, maybe they can, but it's going to take re retraining, and many people are not going to be able to do that kind of retraining. And so, you know, this, this creates some level of unemployment. Is this kind of unemployment bad? Well, I would say no. And not, not, that, not that we want people to be unemployed, but also, I don't want to be listening to eight track cassette tapes either, right? I mean, technological change in, in many ways is good, but there are some costs to it, right? And so this is one of the, the negative side effects. But to prevent these jobs from disappearing is really, a, is, is really to prevent innovation, right? Is really to prevent innovation. So 
you know, when people talk about saving jobs in coal mining West Virginia, they could just as easily be saying preventing jobs in new clean energy because they're really the flip sides of the same coin, right? To, to have innovation in clean energy really means the disappearing of old industries that are focused on you know, fossil fuels. So structural unemployment is a big part of this, a uh, big part of unemployment. Um, there, there's also, you know, part of structural unemployment can also be tied to government policy, such as minimum wage laws. So minimum wages is really something that economists struggle with. Um, are minimum wage laws good? Are they bad? I would say the traditional thinking in economics is that they're, they're more bad than good. Why? Well, it's just a simple supply and demand argument. Let's think about a labor market. So here, the market is not for pizza or for beer. The market is for people. So once again, you have a supply and you have a demand. And that determines wages and the quantity of labor, right? So here we're just treating people as commodities, right? Instead of beer as a commodity. Well, what is a minimum wage law? A minimum wage law essentially says, no, that can't be the equilibrium wage. You have to keep the wage up here. The wage can't fall below this minimum. Well, what's this minimum wage then going to create? That's going to be the demand for labor. That's going to be the supply of labor. The supply of labor is greater than the demand for labor. This is unemployment. So economists traditionally have not been very big fans of minimum wage laws because we tend to believe that they create unemployment. And particularly among people who are low skilled and relatively poor, right? So, you know, if, if you work in Silicon Valley, does the minimum wage make any difference to you? No, your wage is way above the minimum wage, but who's working at the minimum wage? It's usually, Teenage kids, low-skilled people, people with not a lot of education, people who tend to live closer to the poverty line. And so economists do worry that this tends to hurt those people the most. And in, in, in trying to help those people, you often hurt those people. Now, I will have to say this is not the class to get into it, but economists really struggle with this because, yes, this is a reason to be worried about unemployment and minimum wages. But there's also some reasons to think that minimum wages might make some sense, right? Particularly because many people say that there's, that in many markets, people who hire labor are essentially monopolists. And they use monopoly power to essentially keep wages down here. <laughs> right? In other words, they, they use monopoly power to keep wages below equilibrium. And so what then can a minimum wage do? It can force those companies to wave, raise mate wages up to a, a more reasonable level. And so, you know, I'll just kind of leave this discussion by saying this is a big debate among economists, right? This is one of those areas where economists disagree. Um, and in fact, you know, you can, if you're interested in this, you can get on Google and you can find any number of studies, right? Um, in which economists are really arguing about this, right? To what extent does do minimum wage laws create unemployment? And, you know, it, the data is surprisingly unclear, right? Surprisingly unclear. All right. A second source of unemployment. Frictional unemployment. 
This comes from the fact that, as I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, people are always just kind of turning around in the labor market. People are moving. There's hiring. There's firing. People spend time looking. Nowadays, the average job lasts less than three years. So the, so the average amount of time and spent in one job is less than three years. So, You got to think about um, unemployment is like water in a bathtub. I get this is the best best analogy I can give. Okay, think about a bathtub where you have a drain and that's taking the water out, and then a faucet where the water's going in. Right. So what happens if those two things are not completely in sync? Well, there's going to be a level of water in the bathtub. And that's kind of what happens with frictional unemployment. People are leaving the market, right? So that's the water in, and then people are getting back into the labor market. That's the drain, but sometimes those aren't exactly synced. And so you'll have a little level of water, right? And that little level of water is the average unemployment, right? And so a lot, the reason why we never see 0% unemployment is because of frictional unemployment, right? There's always going to be some people who have left the job and are looking for a job. This kind of unemployment is largely a good thing because we don't want people to be stuck in a job for 50 years, right? We want people to be able to move around to different jobs, right? That's probably efficient, good for the economy. So this is an awkward place to, to stop. <laughs> But I feel like I, I, I think this is 11 o'clock, you better stop here. So we didn't get to the third thing, right? We didn't get to the third thing, which is cyclical unemployment. So I'll, I'll pick up with this tomorrow. We'll talk about that, and we'll talk about some of those other questions. Okay, um, I've got a few minutes. If anybody wants to kind of uh, hang out and uh, chat for a couple minutes, feel free to do so. Or you can get in contact with me, and maybe we can set up a time to Zoom later, if not today, tomorrow morning. Okay, thanks everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hold on one second. Let me.